السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Welcome brothers and sisters Today's topic we have chosen How to build yourself How to build yourself How to be a strong believer How to have a strong personality How to build your character Brothers and sisters First and foremost, before you can build a character, you need to have your relationships right. And the first relationship we need to have is the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is not there, you have no foundation. The relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets the pace for every other relationship in your life. Everything in your life. It gives life the deepest meaning that one could even fathom. Otherwise, life becomes temporary meaning, short-lived meaning. Some people live only for their family, but family will go away. Some people live for their money, business and money will go away. Some people live while they have their health, but health is not guaranteed, suddenly it goes away. If we lose these things that we live for, what becomes of us? We start seeing life as meaningless more and more. And that's the result of why certain people fall into certain problems, mental illnesses, and God forbid, some people don't even see any reason to live on. The first thing, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the first thing. And I'm just going to quote an ayah from the Quran and one hadith Qudsi, which should, inshallah, explain how do we build our relationship with Allah. Very simply, Allah says, in Surah Al-Imran from verse 190 to 195. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Raheem Al-Lazina Yalkuroon Allah Qiyaman Wa Qu'udan Wa Ala Junubihim Wa Yatafakkaroon Fi Khalqi Samawat Wal Ard Rabbana ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار. We'll translate this much insha'Allah and then another two verses. Having a relationship with Allah, brothers and sisters, begins here where Allah says, Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the day and the night, there are signs for people of reason. They are those who remember Allah while standing, sitting, and lying on their sides, and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. And they pray, O oh, our Lord, you have not created all of this without purpose. Glory be to you. Protect us from the torment of the fire. Our Lord, indeed, those you commit to the fire will be completely disgraced and the wrongdoers will have no helpers. Our Lord, we have heard the caller to true belief, proclaiming believe in your Lord alone. So we believed. Our Lord, forgive our sins, absolve us of our misdeeds and allow us each to die as one of the virtuous. Our Lord, grant us what you have promised us through your messengers and do not put us to shame on the day of judgment for certainly you never fail in your promise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally says the verse before, رَبَّنَا وَآتِنَا مَا وَعَدْتَنَا عَلَىٰ رُسُلِكَ وَلَا تُخْزِنَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ 
إنك لا تخلف الميعاد فاستجاب لهم ربهم أني لا أضيع عمل عامل لا أضيع عمل عامل منكم ذكر أو أنثى بعضكم من بعض. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So their Lord responded to them, I will never deny any of you, male or female, the reward of your deeds. Both are equal in reward. My dear brothers and sisters, from here we can understand from these simple verses that there is an intimate relationship happening. There is this two-way relationship happening between you and Allah, you and God. From the verse you understand that the first thing is that you have believed and the most important thing is that you converse with Allah, you talk to Allah. So your relationship with Allah is built, brothers and sisters, by praying your five daily prayers, by charity, donation, doing good deeds and constantly having a time in the night where you don't distract yourself and you dedicate a few minutes to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep saying Rabbana, Rabbana, Rabbana even the word our Lord, our Lord, our Lord is a loving relationship between you and Allah when you think of Allah, think of Him as your Lord what is the meaning of Lord? Lord only means caretaker, guardian, creator the one who gives you, the one who looks after you the one who protects you the one who is there with you and the one who guides you your Lord, Rabbana. This is how we address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters. We call him as Rabbana, Ar Rabb. There is no one who cares for us more than him. And you seek refuge in him and you ask him to fulfill his promise that he gave as we believed in the messengers and prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't cut off your connection with me. Because if you cut off your connection with me, the connection will be cut off. Allah never cuts you off. But it is us who cut Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala off. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always has the door open. We can always return. As you can see in these verses, there's constant repetition of, oh, our Lord, forgive us. Oh, our Lord, grant us salvation. Save us. Protect us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves this type of relationship because it's a one of intimacy. You're pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep you protected. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you, don't worry, but you say, my Lord, protect me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when... He sees you doing that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy encompasses you. Right? It's like when a, a child says to his mother or her mother, Mum, please, you know, make sure that I'm safe. Make sure that tomorrow at school I've got my lunch. Otherwise, I won't have anything to eat. If you, you know, like a five-year-old or something. And when the mother hears these words, only the compassion and mercy hits her. And she says, how can I leave my own son? My son is worried that I'm not going to look after him. And the more you say it, the more the mother gets teary over these words. She says, stop, don't say it, don't say it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tells us about our parents whenever he mentions his name in the Quran. Because our origin came from our parents and our original origin came from... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, whoever does not have a relationship with Allah, the life becomes meaning, less meaningful and only temporary. And as you all know, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died, Abu Bakr anhu stood up and he said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qad mat. Whoever worshipped Muhammad, then he has died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa man kana ya'budu Allah fa inna Allah hayyul la yamut. Whoever worships has always worshipped Allah. Allah is ever living. He will never die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us, however, with one little tender, uh, how can I say it? In Arabic, it's called a itab. It's like when you, love, you care about someone, but you tell them something to be weary of. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran also, He says, Some humans, when good happens to them, they stay connected to me, to Allah. And when something, a calamity befalls them, they begin to cut me off their life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, everything is from Allah, but you need to put your patience and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever happens. You know, brothers and sisters, when COVID hit and some of us who got sick, alhamdulillah, many of us made it through. May Allah have mercy on those who passed away. Some of us lost our sense of smell. Some of us lost our sense of taste. I did, subhanAllah. Till today, I haven't got my entire taste back, subhanAllah. But when you lose your senses, something as simple as a smell or a taste, and then suddenly it comes back, you feel like you own the world, subhanAllah. And when we always have it with us, we forget the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So sometimes Allah may diminish something from you 
to keep you connected and appreciative because we are naturally forgetful beings. So brothers and sisters, everything Allah does with us is to keep you connected and knowing a meaningful life, a life that's beyond here, to make it through insha'Allah. Brothers and sisters, I quote now a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu which is in Sahih Bukhari 6502. It's called the Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke it, but it's not Qur'an. So it wasn't sent down as wahi, uh, revelation is a scripture, nor was it just the Prophet's words which were said to him to say them in his own words. They are Allah's words said in human form. And they're not like the Qur'an, but they're a little bit higher than hadith, a little bit lower than ayah. They are called Quran, uh, hadith Qudsi. So when the Prophet ﷺ speaks on behalf of God, on behalf of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, He said, Man aada li waliyan, Allah speaks. He says, whoever takes a close believer of mine, someone who is always close to me in the day and the night, and lives their life by my guidance, he's called a wali, a close servant of mine. Whoever takes a close servant of mine as an enemy, as an enemy, hurts them, hurts them, insults them, or anything like that, فَقَدْ بَارَزَنِي بِالْمُحَارَبَةِ Then he or she who hurts that servant of mine who is close to me, then they have declared war for a combat with me. In other words, Allah declares war over that person. You mess with my servant, then you have declared war against me. He then said, And there isn't anything that my servant comes closer to me that I love more than the things which I have made compulsory upon him. The compulsory salat and the compulsory acts of worship, brothers and sisters, are the most beloved to Allah. They are the ones that connect you the most with Allah. That's why we make them the priority. Then Allah says, And my servant continues to get closer to me by doing acts which I did not make compulsory upon him. They are called voluntary acts, nawafil, such as voluntary salat, voluntary donation, voluntary good deeds that you do out of your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Hatta uhibbu until I love him. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you in a certain way different to others. Not Allah's love for people is not the same. The more you connect with him, the more love, love increases. The further away you feel it, you feel how you're distant from him. The closer you feel that love. So Allah says, Begin, I, I love him in a special way or her. And when I love them in that special way, I become their hearing which they hear with, their eyes which they, their sight which they see with, their hands which they touch with, their legs which they walk with. Then he starts to hear by my hearing, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not literal, that when he or she listens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides their ears to love to listen to the things which he loves. And his ears begins to hate the things which Allah hates. And his eyes see what Allah loves to see. And his eyes hate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And his hands and feet the same. Allah says, and if he were uh, to ask me for anything or she, I will give them. And if they sought refuge in me, I will save them. And there isn't anything I ever hesitated to do more than when I hesitate to take my servant's soul at the time of death. For my soul, for my mu'min believer, my believing servant hates death and I hate to cause him or her harm. However, death is inevitable. This hadith, as I said, is in Bukhari, number 6502, and similar to it in Muslim. As you can see, brothers and sisters, when we think about Allah, this is what He's telling us. This is the type of relationship that He is talking about. So, first and foremost, brothers and sisters, establish your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing your five daily prayers, never leave them out. Increase in your voluntary work. Fast voluntary days. Donate and give charity. Even if it's moving an obstacle off the road, it is a form of charity which Allah loves. Smiling in your family's face to your parents, to your siblings, to your brothers and sisters, to your children, to your spouse, your wife and your husband, to your Muslim brothers and sisters, to bring happiness to other people, to ward off harm from other people, to defend another person who is innocent, to speak well, to withhold your anger and not act out in the wrong way. Of course, anger, sometimes it's good and some, most often it's bad. But to restrain yourself from letting your emotions do the wrong thing, from monitoring what is 
halal and what is haram and fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in night and day with what you earn and what you spend, how you nourish yourself and what you speak and what you learn. And all of these brothers and sisters is being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally Allah says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Worship your Lord until death or certainty, until certainty comes to you. Certainty is death. Why did Allah call, call it certainty? Because no person in the entire world, nothing, not even an animal, Muslim or not Muslim, uh, human or animal, jinn or angel, can deny that death is inevitable. That's why Allah called it yaqeen, certainty. And what is death to us as Muslims? It is when your soul completely leaves your body and you return to Allah. And then after that, you come back alive. So death means returning back to the one who put you here. Allah. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we belong and to Him we will return. Brothers and sisters, moving on now. Now I want to talk about yourself. What is a believer? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe a believer and what does Allah and His Messenger teach us in building ourselves? How should a believer have a relationship with his or herself? How do you love yourself? How do you honor yourself? You must build yourself. Your body is a trust. Your mind is a trust. Your wealth is a trust. Your life is a trust. And the people God put with you, Allah put with you, are a trust. Your children, your spouses, your parents, your wealth, your work, everything you have is a trust. So let us understand what Allah wants us to do with our bodies, with our mind, and with our lives. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said in a hadith which is in, collected by Sahih Muslim uh, number 2664. المؤمن القوي خير وأحب إلى الله من المؤمن الضعيف. The strong believer is more beloved and better to Allah than the weak believer. وفي كل خير and each one of them has goodness in them. احرص على ما ينفعك. Be uh, what's the word for it? Be diligent, thank you, Nuh. Be diligent on what benefits you. Wasta'in billahi wa la ta'jaz. Always work and act by seeking Allah's assistance. Always make dua, seeking Allah's assistance. Wa la ta'jaz. And do not become paralyzed. Do not become paralyzed. Wa in asabaka shay'un fala taqul law anni fa'altu kana kadha wa kadha. But if something, a calamity were to befall you, something that was unexpected, that hurt you, not according to your goals, happened, a tragedy, a calamity befalls you, do not resort to start saying and repeating, if only I did this or that, such and such a thing would have happened. وَلَكِنْ قُلْ قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ Instead say, Allah has pre-measured and what He wills He does. فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحُوا عَمَلَ الشَّيْطَانِ for the word if, constantly repeating it and constantly uh, sickening yourself with it night and day, opens the door to the shaitan. What does this mean, brothers and sisters? A strong believer, the ulama talked about two types of things that make you strong. The one, the first one is your connection with Allah. So your iman strong, there's no doubt. But the correct meaning, which the majority of the scholars talked about, including Imam al nawawi and others, they said, a strong believer is the one who builds his or her resources, their skills, their knowledge, their health, looks after their health, strong mind, has good friends around them, builds their character. Such a person is a strong believer. Why? Because a strong believer, he said, is more beneficial and more beloved to Allah because they serve more, they can help more, they can produce more, they can assist more. They are not beggars, they are givers. They are not weak, they are strong. Then the weak believer, a weak believer who doesn't have many resources, doesn't build their skills, doesn't build their knowledge much, and rather becomes dependent on society and the community. They're the ones that most likely will receive rather than building themselves. But the Prophet ﷺ did say both of them have good in them. They're both still good, but one is more beloved than the other. Allah loves the strong believer and loves the weak believer. 
meaning the resourceful believer and the non-resourceful believer. But the resourceful believer who has strength is better and more beloved to Allah because they can help more. And the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ the, the, the best of the people is the one who is most beneficial to people. So an incapacitated person becomes a burden and a beggar, whereas a person with strength gives. There is a story about a man who went out to seek his rizq, his provision. So he left his town seeking work and, and skills and so on to make money. He arrived at a town and he slept in a hotel. And when he came out in the morning, he saw, he saw a bird, a very a, a sick bird, an injured bird who couldn't fly. And he wondered how this bird is surviving. As he's watching, he saw a healthy bird fly from the sky with a bit of worms and other food and started feeding the injured bird. So the man, he said to himself, Subhanallah, here I am going out to seek my provision. When my provision is already written, if my provision is going to come to me, Allah will bring it to me. Just like he brought it to this injured bird. So he packed his bag and bags and decided to go back to his town. He says, khalas, my provision is written. When he got there, he had a sheikh, an imam, a scholar. And that's why, brothers and sisters, a person who knows, a person who learns, is more beneficial than a jahil, a person who doesn't know, than an ignorant person. An ignorant person will make many mistakes. A knowledgeable person is the one that can guide and fix. An ignorant person destroys and damages, even if their intention is good. So he went to his imam, the scholar, a scholar, a learned man, and he said to him the story. And after that he said, wouldn't Allah provide me as is written? He said, yes, definitely. Nothing happens without Allah's provision. Everything is written for you that is true. But I want to ask you a question, the imam said. Do you want to be the bird that receives? Or do you want to be the bird that gives? The bird that provides, the bird that helps? Because one of them is more beloved to Allah than the other. So brothers and sisters, with working and with doing things comes Qadar as well. Qadar works within the natural world. Qadar is not something supernatural that just comes down from the heavens. And that's something I really feel sad about a lot of the Muslim Ummah. They put their trust too much on supernatural things because it doesn't need much work. They wait for a sign to come down from the heavens in some supernatural way. And that's a false way of looking at dua, looking at things like istikhara, looking at dreams, looking at all these things and then basing your entire decisions of your life on a dream that you saw. Or looking at istikhara as being some kind of miraculous outcome that has to happen. Some people say to me, if I do an istikhara, I'm meant, I'm meant to receive some kind of miraculous feeling that descends upon me. No, brothers and sisters, you could get a feeling, but the response to an istikhara is not that. Some say, I need to see a dream. Brothers and sisters, that's not good to rely on a dream. You may see, you may not, and no one can interpret it the right way. The shaitan can come and mislead you. So the answer to the istikhara is not a dream. In general, dreams are good, but you can't base it on that. We can't base it on things that are variable and we don't have any measure. It can easily mislead you. So don't hook ourselves too much on these things. Qadar works with the way Allah created life. So for example, if you're going to walk, didn't Allah give you legs? That is Qadar. He gave you the legs to walk. And his Qadar works hand in hand with your determination and with your physical mechanical work to walk, to go and get drink, to go and sa'i, seek. So the dua and istikhara works as reliance on Allah while you continue, continue to go. And then if the walls all stop you and, there, and you find no other way anymore, then know that Alhamdulillah Allah is guiding you somewhere else. But don't wait for some kind of supernatural sign. That's the wrong approach, brothers and sisters. So al-mu'min al-qawi, meaning a determined, strong, resourceful, skilled believer is better than a weak believer, than a believer who sits and worships all day in their little worshipping house. And obviously when you have more knowledge, you are far more beloved and, more, and better and more beneficial than a person without knowledge. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, be diligent on what benefits you. Again, we can see this. Everything in life, you have resources. Don't waste your time on things that have no benefit for you in your hereafter 
or in your world. Both brothers and sisters. This hadith is talking about worldly and the hereafter. But then when you get your worldly, then direct it in a way that benefits you in your hereafter. So join dunya and deen and let it serve your hereafter. Avoid the haram and go for the halal. And inshallah, make your intention for the sake of Allah and use your resources that benefits you, your family and others that will benefit you for your hereafter. <laughs> Be diligent on things that benefit you. There are some people who would sit on their phones night and day, scrolling away, getting nothing out of it but cats and dogs and entertainment. Uh, and, uh, you know, cats and dogs, when they jump around on, on TikTok and I don't know what, and they spend an hour just looking at things that don't benefit them. So, brothers and sisters, and some people just sit there for hours. Yani, this is valuable time that we are wasting. Yes, you can entertain yourself, you can joke, you can, this is all good. But don't do it as a habit where you having no benefit afterwards. Always have something that benefits you and build your life. Some person, one person said, well, what about, does it only have to be religious knowledge? He says, no, of course not. Religious knowledge is one, but there are thousands of other areas that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to use as resources to help the ummah and to help people. It doesn't matter what it is. Anything in life that is halal and skillful. Even money. You work for money and then you use it in the path of Allah to help people or to build yourself and family. All of this is fi sabilillah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, seek Allah's assistance. No matter what you do, always seek Allah's help. Ya Rabb, make this easy. One dua that you can say is this. اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Oh Allah, there is no ease except what you make easy and you can make the difficult easy Always say words like that before or during your endeavor and even after your endeavor anything that you do in life ولا تعجز Don't become paralyzed What does this mean? It means plan seek advice investigate manage yourself and then once you've planned and you come to implement your plan, he said, don't become paralyzed. Keep going. Because some people, they plan and right to the point of implementing, they get cold feet. They stand back. Something just stops them. They have the ability, but they're not confident in themselves. Meaning that they don't think they're going to do it. Uh, Rasul Sallallahu said, don't. Just keep going. Then just in case things fail, Rasul Sallallahu covers you for any possible mental illnesses that can result of it, or any low self-esteem dangers. He says, if something didn't go as planned, musibah, calamity means that when, when something is expected and then something, the, something ruins it, the opposite happens, it's not expected. You're driving your car and you're meant to go from here to your home. God forbid an accident happens. You didn't expect an accident. That's called a musibah. So Rasulullah said, if something doesn't go as planned, a musibah happens, then do not say if, 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 if. What does it mean if? If means those types of people who develop an OCD over it, obsessed over crying and getting nothing out of it but sadness, misery and blame. That's the type of if a Rasul Sallallahu warned us against. You cannot change the past. Say Allah has pre-measured and what He wills, He does. Let go of it and say Allah has willed it. Whether it's my fault, whether it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directing me somewhere else, it doesn't matter what, what it was. It was written, supposed to be there for some reason, but I don't know what tomorrow holds. So Rasul says, don't reminisce. If you can learn from what happened, such as management, learn from your mistake, take it. Take it. For everything for a believer is good. That's how a believer looks at life. Then move forward and keep going, keep going, keep going. So long as Allah has given you breath to breathe and life, it means you still have a purpose in this world. Always know that. We move on now. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I've listed, there are many qualities that build your character as a believer. I've listed at least, or minimum, that everyone should have. I've listed ten. Some of them you'll know already, but I'm just going to go over them and explain them briefly each, insha'Allah. All of these ten are from the Qur'an and Sunnah. Even the Prophet ﷺ, if you study his life, you'll see these are his qualities as well. And each one has an example of it in his seerah, in his biography. So, the first thing, brothers and sisters, all these ten qualities is about loving yourself. You know that statement, love yourself? 
Unfortunately, the modern human today, the, the modern person, has twisted and missed the point of what loving yourself means. The modern person today thinks that loving yourself means that you don't care about anyone except yourself. What do you mean you don't care? There's no care, there's no kindness anymore, just yourself? I don't care what happens to everyone else so long as I'm good. Loving yourself these days is about superficial outside appearance these days. What you drive, indulging in your luxuries, indulging in my desires. So long as I like it and I'm enjoying it, I don't care if it's halal or haram. I don't care who it harms. I don't care what it's doing to me. If I like it and I love it, I'm loving myself. Loving yourself does not mean indulging, making yourself spoilt, spoil yourself. You won't do that to your child. A child that's spoilt grows up entitled. They're the rudest. They're the most obnoxious. People don't want to be around them. So when you spoil yourself, you're not loving yourself, you're destroying yourself. Your self needs discipline. Your self needs to grow by giving it what makes it better. Loving yourself means building yourself, my dear brothers and sisters. And sometimes in building yourself, there's going to be a bit of pain. There's going to be a bit of struggle. But the result is you're a better person. Serve yourself and build yourself. That's how you love yourself. So number one, the first condition of building yourself is knowing yourself. You must know yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, what you know and what you don't know. Knowing yourself, brothers and sisters, is knowing what you have that you can give, what you have that you can use, what you have that is useful, and what you don't have that makes you useless. Try to build those skills as much as you can. Humble yourself. So once you know yourself and you know your reality, don't appear to people exactly in your reality. Appear to people a little bit less than your reality. That's called humbleness. And that is what the Prophet ﷺ said, Man rafa'a. Whoever humbles themselves for the sake of Allah, Allah will lift them. Make yourself a little bit less than your reality. If you make yourself better than you look like you're more than what you really are, then you're going into areas of arrogance, kibr, and fakeness, and hypocrisy. And that is going to come back to haunt you. You're going to have low self-esteem after that because you'll fail. You know, when you see some young people, they see that others are looking at them, and then they tense their muscles and they want to fight and prove how strong they are. And let's say they haven't got training in fighting, but they feel overconfident. But they know they don't have the ability. So they're appearing more than what their reality is. Or to go into an area that you know is not within your ability. The Prophet ﷺ said, do not, uh, he said, ask Allah not to make you devalue yourself. They said, how do you devalue yourself, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, by entering into an endeavor or into a task that you know you cannot do. So know yourself and don't burden yourself with something you cannot do. Work within your capacity. Know yourself and know your strengths and weaknesses and stay humble. So this is the first thing, brothers and sisters. Have you ever been on the aeroplane before? Yeah. Of course, most of us have. And before we fly, the flight attendants, they say in the event of an unlikely emergency, oxygen masks will fall from above. Don't they say that? They say, uh, put it on yourself before attending to others. Even if your own child is struggling for breath, why do you put the oxygen mask on yourself? Huh? So you can help them. If you don't breathe, you can't help them to breathe. But if you put it on them and then you, and then you die out of loss of breath, there goes your child as well. Isn't that correct? So brothers and sisters, you need to strengthen yourself. So in Islam, building yourself is the first thing. Number two, brothers and sisters, is called self-esteem. Self-esteem. 
Self-esteem is your opinion of yourself. What do you think of yourself? The way you think of yourself is how you have decided, where you have decided to put yourself, where your ranking is. And I want to give you a little hint from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, how to be so you can lift your self-esteem. Every one of you has been chosen to be born into this world. Allah is the one who decided and chose you. And He honored you. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored the children of Adam. So you are already special and you are already important. But what you think of yourself makes the world of a difference. And here is a little advice. When you meet people, you put people on a certain pedestal, either up or you put them lower. This is natural. We look at people in different... The majority, the modern person today, bases the esteem of another person and their status on materialistic things. What car they drive, what job they have, what position in the job, how much money they have, whether they're popular or famous or not, whether they look good on the outside, whether they've got more views on social media and likes, all these things. The materialistic, superficial things the modern person looks at. And I'll give you one example. You all know in Big W, they had a terrible children's book. I don't know if you heard about it. A children's book which talks too much inappropriate adult material with pictures and everything. Recommended for children between 7 and 10, I think, or 10 years old. Wallahi, if you looked at it, you'll say, where is the, khalas, the last hour is coming. Because of the amount of people that protested against it, they took it off the shelf. Why? Because it's going to hurt the pocket, the business, the industry. We live in a world where materialism is big. All right. A Muslim is taught another way. Your self-esteem is not based on outside appearances or materialistic things. You, when you amplify a person in front of you, you make them big then you automatically reduce yourself. And when you amplify yourself, then you reduce others. And both of them are toxic. Both of them will kill you. One of them is kibir and arrogance, and it will destroy you. And the other one is putting yourself down and not giving yourself the importance it needs. What is the answer? Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "And tunzilu nasa manazilahum," to put everyone in their place, meaning consider them where they belong. And where does everyone belong? What am I? What are you? We are humans. That director of that company is a human. That boss of yours is a human. That husband and wife is a human. Your parents are human. Your children are human. Your friends who've got this or that is a human. The person who's driving that expensive car has a lot of that money is a human. At the end of the day, we're all humans. Number two, we have all been created by Allah for the same purpose. We are all in the same exam. If they've got one skill, you have another. Maybe that person who, is, who looks like is above you has problems with their family. You might have a good relationship with your family. Embrace that. Alhamdulillah. That person may have some health problems. Alhamdulillah, you've got good health. That person may have, doesn't have a hobby outside of what they have or other skills which they enjoy. Maybe you have a hobby and things that you enjoy and skills. Everybody, Allah has given them favors. So don't amplify yourself and don't reduce yourself by amplifying them. Think of them as humans. Yes, we respect certain people and give them more attention than others if they are beneficial and if they deserve it. Such as scholars and imams or someone who is truly beneficial to others and has earned that privilege, you give them that respect. But never think that they are better than you or that you are better than them. Uh, they can rise and fall. You can rise and fall. And don't be arrogant so to say, oh, who, who are they? This is the thing. Sometimes I hear young people, they go too far. They say, who are they? Who are you, bro? You're nothing. That's called arrogance. Remember what we said. Don't amplify yourself by reducing others and don't reduce yourself by amplifying others. Be balanced. And that's why Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And this is how we have made you a balanced ummah. Not too much, not too little. Be balanced.
That's what Rasul said, Allah loves al wasat fil umuri kulli. He loves the balance in all matters. So work towards that balance. So brothers and sisters, for your self-esteem, look at that. Number three is confidence or overconfidence or underconfidence. And there is the mature side. So it's got to do with confidence. What is confidence? In order for you to know yourself that you are confident, that's part of building yourself, you need two things. You need to feel that you can do that thing. And number two, you need to know that you have the ability to do that thing. Ability and feeling. That is confidence. The second type is called mature. To be mature means that you know you do not have the ability to do it and you feel that you can't do it. And for example, if I'm going to fight with someone and I know that this person has training, I don't have the training that person has. And I know that I don't have the ability and I feel that I can't. I choose my fights. So a mature person chooses their battles. Doesn't go into everything and anything. Yeah, I can do and be a hero. That's called ego. And you're going to fall flat on your face. A mature person and a believer chooses what they can and what they can't. And go, walks away. It's okay. It's fine. The third type is called overconfidence. Overconfidence, brothers and sisters, is when you know you don't have the ability, but you feel you can do it. Don't. Don't do that. You'll destroy yourself. And the last one is called underconfidence. Underconfidence is when you know you have the ability, and when it comes the time to implement it, you don't feel you have the ability. And this is what Rasulullah said, فَلَا تَعْجَزْ Rely on Allah and go forward. Be brave. Be brave as much as you can. The first step you take, inshallah, the next time you'll have the next step. And that is a quality of the believer. Once, as you know, in the biography of the Prophet wasallam, in the Battle of Uhud. Do you remember the Battle of Uhud? In the Battle of Uhud, the enemies of Islam were coming to attack the Muslims in Medina. And they had gathered the largest army yet. The Muslims were going to be annihilated if you look at just numbers and the allegiances against them. The story is long. And the Battle of Uhud, the Muslims started to motivate the Prophet ﷺ and insist on going out. Rasul ﷺ had seen a dream. And he came out to them and said, I saw in my dream, and you know, the dream of the Prophet is from Allah. He said, I was wearing a solid armor. And he said, I was wearing a solid armor. And I saw cattle that were slaughtered in front of me. They said, what do you think, Ya Rasulullah? He said, I think we should stay in Medina. It's an armor. And if we go out, it's going to be a catastrophe. Now, they said, Ya Rasulullah, is this your interpretation about war? He said, yes. They said, we think, Ya Rasulullah, that you may have made a mistake. Now, uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't give it in a, in a form of command. He gave it, said, look, this can happen or that can happen. They said, we think we should go out. Among them was Hamza radiallahu anhu. He said, Ya Rasulullah, go out. Wallahi, I will not meet them except there. These people are like this and like that. Then they got too confident. Now the Prophet ﷺ went back inside and he wore his normal armor. He wore two armors that day and a heavier helmet. When he came out, the Muslims felt guilty. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we felt guilty. We weren't thinking. We'll take what you said. Listen to what he said. He says, no prophet wears an armor and then takes it back off. What does it mean? He says, now that we have made a decision, we move with it. We do not take a step backwards. And this is the way to build your character. Once you've planned, you've gotten advice, you've all agreed, and you've made a decision, and you've moved away, keep going with that decision. Until a catastrophe happens, like something really is obvious. So nothing was obvious yet, just ideas. He said, we don't. We move forward and we do not hesitate anymore. As Allah says, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Once you are determined, rely on Allah and move forward. That's how all the prophets were. When they moved forward to the battle of Uhud, they almost won the battle. But we all know the archers on the hill, their love for the spoils of war got to them. And you all know they're still all new Muslims. So they're still used to battles and taking the spoils. They forgot the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. He told them, don't go off the hill. 
And then they said, the spoils of war, go and get your stuff. And, all, and most of them came off the hill. When they came off the hill, Khalid ibn al-Walid, who was a disbeliever at that time, he was the horseman who led the horses, and he found a way to come in like a hook, and they surrounded the Muslims because now they were disorganized and there was no one on the hill to stop them from coming in, and the Muslims, many were massacred, just like the dream of the Prophet Sallallahu And the Prophet himself was injured in that battle, and he almost died, he almost got killed. And Hamza, the one who said, let's go out, he got martyred in that battle too. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Allah says in this, about this battle, He said in a long, obviously in Surah At-Tawbah and others, that what had happened to you, I'm just translating, what had happened to you, you may assume that it was bad for you, بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ It is good for you. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah knows and you do not know. Whatever has happened to you of musibah, think of it as good. Allah is guiding us to tell us that even when you fail, be optimistic even in failure. It's hard, but we have the Qur'an telling us. Because you can overturn a failure into success. So what do you do with the failure? You learn from it. I always repeat this same analogy. A baby, how does a baby learn how to walk? Just learn from the baby. The baby gets up and falls, gets up and falls in different ways. The baby is subconsciously learning, say, he f- say it fell a hundred times. It's learning a hundred ways of how not to fall, by falling a hundred times. The only way to learn a hundred ways of how not to fall is by falling a hundred times. So Allah tells them, it was not bad for you, it is good, no matter how it appears. And truly it was after that, they learned a big lesson. We move on to the fourth one, self-management, brothers and sisters. Now this is something that I see a lot of people neglect. Self-management and discipline. To have good self-management and discipline, Islam teaches us, Get your priorities right. Get your priorities right. You can't take everything. You have to say one, two, three priorities. Number two, have time management. Make a time for everything. Don't, do, don't just use your time and, and waste it on everything. No. And number three, know that in life, you're going to have three types of interactions with people. Don't be one without the other. You ready for it? in managing your interactions with people and yourself. So we said prioritize, we said time management, and number three, you need, you need to use people and they use you. So here's what it is. Number one, as Ibn Taymiyyah and other scholars, I think Imam Nawawi said this, Allahu A'lam, I may have made a mistake, but they said something wise. They said, Imma an takuna asiran, you might be a prisoner in life, aw naziran, or equal to others, aw amiran, or a commander. To be a prisoner is when somebody does a favor for you. Now you owe them. You're kind of like a prisoner, metaphorically speaking. It's not a bad thing. They just say, asir means you do owe them. When you see them, I I owe them. Or equal. Equal means when you don't need others and they don't need you. So you have skills to look after yourself. That's a beautiful place to be. You don't owe anyone anything. They don't owe you. You are equal to them. And number three, a commander is when you do good for others. They owe you now. You can't be a commander always because you'll be exhausted, always leading other people. You cannot be the asir, the prisoner always, because then you're a loser. And you cannot be equal with everyone else because life, the natural way of life is that you need people and people need you. So don't get an ego about it. Rasul needed people. Sometimes they would need him and other times... He would be equal with them materialistically. Materialistically. I'll give you an example of him being equal. Rasul is a prophet, a messenger of God. He brings us deen. But there are things about life which he doesn't know more than others, such as crops and farming and all that stuff, even in battles and war and location. He used to ask them, what do you think? And sometimes I've said, Ya Rasulullah, we don't agree with what you said. Because it's not a religious matter. It's a normal worldly matter. So you do also need to be equal with others. And that's how life goes. Number five, a person who builds himself or herself must be okay with constructive criticism. You will not learn unless you accept what people say. Sometimes they're rude. Sometimes they're polite. What you've got to do, a strong person is able to sift through the emotions and take what benefits you. 
That's the hadith of Prophet ﷺ. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Be diligent on what benefits you. Sometimes you may receive, uh, if you're on social media, someone puts something that's terribly arrogant and rude. If you can take something from it, good. And go and apply it. If it's all rude and no benefit, ignore it. That's a strong person. Because that person does not make you. And if you let them affect you, that means they've got control over you. Number six. To be a strong person and build yourself, you need to be able to accept your mistakes and be okay with them. You need to accept your mistakes and be okay with them. Completely okay with them. And you need to own your mistakes. That way nobody has control over you. You don't let your mistakes define you either. Someone says you made a mistake, say, so, oh, thank you. Someone acknowledges something and say, I actually acknowledge it. I once had a conversation on the aeroplane with an elderly man, and he was quite intelligent. And a whole trip for two hours, we were talking back and forth. Sometimes he'd make a good point after I had made a point, and I would say, I see. Well, that's a good point. I would acknowledge this point. I said, but I have a different angle as well. What do you think if this happened or that happened? And so that's a good point. What about this one? So we were bouncing off each other. Sometimes I would beat him, sometimes beat me. In the end, alhamdulillah, I, I beat him. But we, we, we were we're going through it's a whole big talk. After we finished, there was a man sitting behind us. He gets up and he puts in and he goes, please allow me to shake the hands of these two gentlemen. Your conversa I've, He said, I haven't seen a conversation between two people like gentlemen in a very long time. Why? Because a gentleman and a, and a strong person, I'm not praising myself, I do make mistakes and sometimes I do fail. We all fail. But the strong person is one who is able to accept that they made a mistake. So what? Watch the stress go off you. Watch how much you'll develop and watch how people will respect you even more. So own your mistakes, acknowledge them and have no problem with it. Everybody makes mistakes. And this will lead you to forgive yourself as well. Some people have problems forgiving themselves. They can never forgive themselves. Accept that if you have done right by Allah, ask Him to forgive you and know that Allah subhanahu wa wipes everything away and you are only human, you make mistakes and you develop and learn. Number seven, very important brothers and sisters, a strong person to build themselves, take this advice. Wallahi, I've, we've tried it and it works tremendously. Very simple, yet very hard to implement. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Min husni islam al mar'i tarkuhu ma la yani. A person to improve their Islam, is to leave that which does not concern them. Don't go into areas that are not your business. Don't ask about things that are not your concern. Don't pry into things that don't concern you. Anything in life, things that don't benefit you are not of your concern. People's problems and people's secrets, don't pry into them. You're not invited, don't ask. Uh, a person didn't call, a per, you called a person twice, three times, they didn't reply, that's it. Don't keep asking. You knocked on a person's door, they didn't answer. You knew they're inside. They didn't answer. Walk away with your dignity and don't talk about it. This is their right, not yours. And accept that. Allah says in, in the Quran, meaning if you go to visit someone or, and they tell you, go back, Allah says, فرجعوا. go back. The right is not yours. Don't sit there talking about it and say, I know they're in there and they're this and they're that. This is not your business. Allahu alam what is, the, what is within there. And that's a high value person. Don't get involved in businesses that are not yours and watch how less stress your life is, how, more he how healthier you'll be, how you'll sleep better, how you'll be happier in life, brothers and sisters. SubhanAllah. Number eight. Easy to say, a bit hard to implement for some people. Avoid as much as you can jealousy, envy, and comparing yourself to, and competing with others in the wrong way, for the wrong reason. Competing with others for the wrong reason. Competition is good, but not for the wrong reasons. Jealousy, envy, and competing with others for the wrong reason will destroy you, my brothers and sisters. It will destroy you. And number nine goes without saying, the modern person knows all this, your diet, your exercise, and your sleep. Three things. All of these are in the sunnah. And maybe one day we'll talk about this in detail. Your diet can make a difference in your energy levels, your esteem, how you feel, your moods, and your health. Your exercise. Rasul used to exercise every day. He used to run. He used to jog. He used to train. One time he even encouraged his wife. He says, let's race. Aisha He beat her. She didn't forget it. 
She says, after a few years, I put on a little bit of weight. Uh, sorry, the first time he... Uh, let me repeat. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told her, let's race. And she beat him. She said, a few years later, I put on a little bit of weight. And he said, let's race. This time he beat me. Obviously, the first time Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam let her beat him anyway. But he's engaging in a nice relationship and also doing exercise together. And she said, oh, it's not fair. I was a little bit lighter that time. And he was laughing, saying, no, we're equal now. You beat me last time, now me, one for one. We're equal. Now we're equal. So that's how Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. And once he tapped one person on his stomach in the salat, he was moving, making the line straight, and he just tapped one person on his stomach, it was a little bit protruding. He was joking with him. And when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on his, about to die on his deathbed, he came out and he said, anybody who has anything that I owe them, that I've wronged them in, come and take your right now. And this man said, Ya Rasulullah, one time you, you hurt me, you tapped me on my stomach. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lifted his shirt up, of course, over his belly button. And he said, take your revenge. So the man kissed his, his, his belly, <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's stomach. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I wanted to get the barakah, the blessing of you. And this is the barakah and the blessing of the prophets is established in the Quran and Sunnah. For diet, health, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, if you can, have a third of your stomach for water, a third for air, and a third for water, for, for food, if you can. So, and the way we sleep, monitor your sleep. Some people, they stay up all night and then they sleep late. Even if you get your 10 hours, it's not enough. You need to sleep early and look after your body. And if you can do a qaylula in the daytime, a little siesta, that'll also help. Brothers and sisters, moving to the last one. Sticking to your rights and your boundaries. How do you know you have a healthy, strong personality? It's when you know your rights. You know other people's rights, you know your boundaries, and you let people know your boundaries, and you know other people's boundaries, and you don't transgress the boundaries. And in this are relationships that become either sick relationships, toxic relationships, lively relationships, or dead relationships. How? It's got to do with rights and boundaries. A lively relationship is when it's filled with justice, kindness, mercy, giving, forgiving, pardoning, talking, discussing. That's called a lively relationship. Husband and wife, friends, brothers and sisters, all of you. The sicken, sickening relationship is when you only do things because you don't want the person to be upset. Oh, I better go, man, but I just don't want to upset them. But you've got priorities. I know, but it's just, I don't want to get them upset. That's low self-esteem. There's a polite way of saying sorry, I can't, and saying no. Don't be a total yes person. The toxic relationship is when people expect you or you expect them to do something that is not their obligation and you don't give them anything in return. Someone expects you to do an obligation for them and they don't give you anything in return and if you don't do it, they will guilt trip you as if it's an obligation. An example, if you have two friends and you decided to invite one friend to a coffee, the other friend finds out, and let's say the other friend is a toxic type. He'll come and guilt trip you and blame you and put you down and say, why didn't you invite me? You're not a loyal friend. You, you know, I know, and then you probably talked about me, and then guilt tripping you like as if it was an obligation. No, it wasn't an obligation. Same with relatives, same with parents, same with children. If there are rights and obligations, of course, let me repeat that. When it comes to people, you have no choice of having a relationship like your parents and your siblings, your cousins. You don't work with them on rights and obligations. Rights and obligations between your relatives are only used when things go wrong. When things, a dispute happens, you go back to whose right, whose right is what. But family should be based on kindness, empathy, goodness, sacrifice, and giving up some of your rights. Not all of them, but some of them. Same with the husband and wife. You, you can't deal with rights, just your right and my right. That's like, two, that's like uh, roommates. It's, which leads me to something called a dead relationship. A dead relationship is where everyone is indifferent. I don't care if you do it, don't do it. I don't care if you have an obligation or not. I don't care if you love me or not. If you're here, I don't, care. I, I don't realize you're here. If you're gone, I don't ask about you. These are type of relationships you have to end. So brothers and sisters, as you can see, there are lots of qualities. These are the ten qualities, alhamdulillah. And I end it with this. 
Some people will hurt you with words and actions. It's up to you what you want to do and be. You can let those words hurt you and change you. Or you can acknowledge and feel sorry for that person. And do what the Prophet ﷺ did. Once he was giving out some charities, and one man from the Ansar said hurtful words. He said, Wallahi, he didn't do justice about the Prophet ﷺ. So another companion said, Wallahi, I will tell the Messenger of Allah what you said about him. He went to the Prophet ﷺ and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, this person said this to you in secret. And the Rasul وسلم, said, he got angry. Why did he get angry? He got angry because he's talking about the messenger of God, that he is unjust. That's got to do with religion and iman. But then he calmed down and said, لَقَدْ أُوذِيَ مُوسَى بِأَكْثَرِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فصبر. Moses was harmed even greater than that by his people, but he remained persevering and patient. So choose your battles and keep your character good. Finally, brothers and sisters, smile. A person with good, strong character is able to smile. A friend uh, said to me they were at uni and they had a presentation in front of the class. And one day a friend got up and was giving the presentation. They were nervous. Everybody staring at them with a blunt face. And this person, who I know, was smiling to the presenter and saying, and just nodding their head and smiling, encouraging them. After they finished, that person never forgot that favor that the friend did for them, smiling and encouraging them. Everybody loves when people motivate and encourages. And smiling goes a huge way. Rasul used to always smile, used to always be cheerful. And it releases beautiful neurotransmitters in your brain and your body, such as dopamine and, and endorphins and serotonin and all these different names, which de-stress you. Some of them are antidepressants. Some of them give you satisfaction and happiness. And some of them, they build your immune system. Anger, however, one minute of anger makes you, your immune system go down by four hours. One moment of happiness and a bit of laughter and smiles build your immune system for 24 hours. So brothers and sisters, this is a strong person, insha'Allah ta'ala. I'm sorry I took long. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى نَبِينَ مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أ